So, um, hello. My name is uh, Christoph Langer. So I'm the second in the row of three guys from SAP speaking here. Um, so the one or the other might know me from the OpenJDK community. Um, you might see me on the mailing list. Um, I, I try to, to support Andrew in maintaining the JDK 11 updates release. I think that's uh, most of the, the work, or which takes most of my time. Um, what I'm doing in OpenJDK at the moment, so it's uh, uh, doing a lot of testing, integration, and so on. But today, um, I actually have the pleasure to talk about the work of my colleagues, um, uh, namely Götz Lindenmeier, who more or less did all the, the uh, progress to bring this into OpenJDK. But he decided to go uh, surfing in South Africa. Usually he's here, but this year, so uh, the turn is on me. Okay, so um, as it's uh, yeah, already a bit late, um, so the brains have been wrenched a little bit over the day. Um, it's maybe not the uh, mostly most sophisticated topic of the day, or at least not from, from how it looks like, because, I mean, a little nine-pointer exception, it's not too complicated, just a little sentence that everybody can understand. But okay, um, there's some, some logic behind it, um, which, is, yeah, which is really quite some, some algorithm, let's say. So, and yeah, um, we come to that later. So, yeah, what I'm going to cover, I start with um, how helpful are the nine-point exceptions currently, um, how, how helpful could they be? So, um, uh, taking a, uh, an example as motivation, um, talk about what we did, what we brought to the OpenJDK, where we are there, and then it's first them, so we talk technical, uh, try to explain the algorithm behind it a little bit, and in the end, uh, there are a few things um, which uh, still um, can be done and could maybe leverage this. So um, yeah, I, I come to that in the end. Okay, yeah, how helpful are nine pointer exceptions? So um, imagine this little code snippet. So I cut and pasted it uh, out of some source code, line 33, we see um, some object with uh, fields, and there's another field, has some payload. There's an assignment um, to this payload field from another um, chain of, of object fields. So what uh, would we get currently? We get uh, something saying exception in thread main, null pointer exception. Okay, we, we see the, the file name and the line, like line 33. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if we um, knew what, what exactly, what, what's the field that's null here? Yeah? Okay, so um, yeah, could be like this. Huh? So it tells cannot read field D because a2.b.c is null. So we know, okay, it was exactly this this guy here. Okay, yeah, obviously, the uh, null point exception could look like this. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is what we uh, contributed to the OpenJDK. Um, actually, the, the, um, the, the thing behind it um, was already implemented years ago um, by colleagues for our commercial um, ed edition of the um, JDK. It's called SubJVM. But only the, the SAP customers um, using SAP products with, based on Java could uh, benefit of it. Um, but we were quite sure that, that it works, at least. And so last year, um, about shortly after FOSTEM, I think, the, the initial mail um, got proposed on the mailing list. Um, just said, OK, it's a little enhancement. Cannot be that thing. Um, yeah, and this proposal was welcomed by people, um, obviously by, by the developers of Java and uh, people saying, yeah, uh, sure, about time to have it in. But um, it was challenged, too, because out of several reasons. So, so one thing um, is always, OK, you don't maybe want to have too much information in exception messages, because you don't want to leak uh, too much data um, to maybe some attacker or so who can then read something. So maybe that's a concern. Then one thing is performance. So we wanna, uh, want to don't have a negative performance impact um, by such um, computation of messages here. And then it was also about the approach. So we did this really in the, in the hotspot VM coding in C++. Um, so people stepped up and said, hey, uh, can we have a look? Maybe we can do it in, in Java um, with, with um, you know, bytecode APIs and stack walking APIs, et cetera. But yeah, OK, th that was part of the discussion. And um, I don't know, it evolved. Um, then people from Oracle came up, and I think they motivated Guts to, to make it a JEP. Yeah, and with the help from, I think, Colleen, Alex Buckley, and so on, so we brought it to, to a point where it was admitted to JDK 14. And we could push um, this uh, to uh, right in time for JDK 14 um, in October last year. So yeah, it's available. But it's not um, the default. Uh, so you have to use this. Um, this flag, 
to activate it. Otherwise, you will see, still see the, the old SCARS message. Um, but yeah, you can you can switch it on. And we, for, for the submachine uh, binary distribution, we uh, switched it uh, on by default. Uh, so we are confident in it. And we also backported it to Submachine 11 edition. So um, if you want to try with, with um, JDK 11, you can use Submachine, and you don't need an additional flag. But I guess, I don't know, we can also discuss about uh, backporting it to open JDK 11 if there's interest. OK, so yeah, uh, some technical insights. Um, the null pointer exception message, um, you see the green line. It says, cannot read field D because A2 dot b dot c is null. Um, it has two parts. So the first part is what went wrong, cannot read field D. Um, and the second part, um, that's the more complicated part, uh, I'd say, you have to go back in the program flow a bit to figure out um, what exactly uh, was the reason what brought the null, point, uh, the null reference onto the, the operand stack. Yeah. Um, and it's also important, at the time we, we can uh, create the message, um, we, have, we have a bytecode index of uh, where we are at the method. Um, well, we, we are, as we are in Hotspot VM, we can query for the bytecode for the constant pool. Um, but we, ha we don't have the, the program data uh, at that moment. We have no variable contents or things like that. So we have to live with, with what we have here. OK, so um, then, OK, let's take some simple example. So really uh, an easy thing. You initialize an object with null and invoke uh, the method to string on it on, on this null reference. So you will get a null pointer exception. So this in bytecode um, will, will work uh, like this. So at first, you have the acons null instruction. This pushes the null reference on the operand stack. So, so basically, Java bytecodes, I know um, maybe people are not so familiar with it. Uh, it works like um, the, the instructions, they push and pop things on an operand stack. And it's defined for each bytecode um, what it's expected before on the operand stack and how it would it look like in the end, what arguments are popped and what's pushed there. So OK, so uh, to, to do an object initialization, you will obviously at first um, then load the, the null, um, you initialize the, the um, a local variable slot, the slot one, with the a star one instruction that pops the null reference from the operand stack and it's stored in the slot. Okay, that was the first line of the example. Then the second line um, does a load one. Um, it loads again from this um, slot of the variable, pushes the value on the stack. So yeah, we had it initialized with null, so there will be a null on the stack. And then we try to invoke uh, the toString method uh, with invoke virtual instruction. Yeah, afterwards, um, the, the, the reference will be gone. But in our case, we get a null pointer exception because it was null. Um, the, the, the method we tried to invoke, uh, the, uh, the, the object we tried to invoke the method on. OK, and now from the failing bytecodes, we can, we can generate this uh, textual message about the failed operation. Um, for the course, we have to walk back, as I said. And so that's what, the, what the, um, this algorithm starts with, is really to, to replay all this um, from, the, from the entry to the method until the point uh, where the null pointer exception happened. Um, that we have for each bytecode, we have a representation of this operand stack. And then from this operand stack, we have backlinks uh, for, for each field um, to the instruction um, which pushed uh, the, the value there. And so then that helps us to, to then um, walk and, and generate the message. OK, so part A, what bytecode fails? Not every bytecode um, can, can cause a null pointer exception. So we have here the, the array operations. So if the array you want to access uh, is null, then you can say something like cannot load from int array, for instance, element type. So um, or the array length, cannot read the array length. Um, so get field and put field instruction. I cannot read. I cannot assign a field. Um, Ideally, we also have the field name from the constant pool here. Um, those invoke instructions, like we saw here, um, they then would, the message would be cannot invoke a method. Um, throwing exceptions and, and um, entering and exiting monitors, they also need um, objects. So yeah, that's a simple switch statement on um, this bytecode, like here, the invoke virtual, and we come to this part A of the message. OK, then for the, for the, for the second part, the because, um, why the null pointer exception was pushed, um, there's a little a bit more uh, to be done here. OK, in the, in the easy case, you have something like a const null. OK, then we can only say null is null, sure. Um, 
There are constant operations, so we, can, we know the constant that is pushed on the stack. We can just name it. So for an array, um, we do two things. So at first, we, we uh, go back the path um, from, for the uh, bytecode that pushed the array reference. So this could also come from another field, um, uh, uh, like in, in the example I had, like several field references. So we really have to go recursively back until the point um, where, where we started at. Um, OK, then, and then we have the, the brackets. And then we, we also write something about who uh, put the index there. Yeah? OK, so get field. The get field, we can write the field name. But then we have uh, to get also the cause for the, for the um, reference that the get field was uh, invoked. Get static, there we have class name and field name. That's the easy thing. Um, so those uh, invoke instructions. Um, so that's when, when methods uh, are called. Then we can say, OK, uh, the return value of the method is. Or uh, so in some places, we all would only give method names, like in, in, um, in the index computations of the array accesses. And then the, the uh, load instructions for, for loading and storing variables. OK, so in, in our case, it was an A load, which put the null reference on the stack. And the A load comes from the, from the um, variable object. And so then we can say, OK, um, cannot invoke object because object is null. OK, so yeah, there, there are some more things I want to mention here about this. So one thing is um, this calculation of the message is only done when we invoke the, the get message uh, method of an exception. So at the time the VM generates uh, such an exception, it really just stores the, the, the bytecode, the stack information, um, as it um, did before. So no change about that. And um, only when somebody calls like print stack trace or so, it will call get message. And then we, we would do all this. Um, so in, in the usual flow of, of um, Java VM, um, you should not see an impact because, I mean, exceptions get thrown, get caught, and uh, not necessarily uh, printed out messages. Um, yeah. Ah, okay, and the first thing uh, was um, it's also uh, we are talking only about the messages uh, generated by the VM itself. So there's also possible like I can do a new null pointer exception, uh, construct an exception, but here, um, yeah, then the, the the developer knows what he's doing. Um, he would probably also enter a meaningful message already. So okay, we won't uh, capture this. Um, then there's something like hidden frames. For instance, when you have uh, lambdas, and, and then there are some frames um, put in by, by Java C and, and the VM. Um, so those stack frames are tagged hidden. So if we hit an null pointer exception there, then uh, we would not um, generate the message because it's probably not so meaningful to, to people looking at the at exception. Then the point, um, it's implemented in, in the um, virtual machine in the C++ code. Um, why did we do that? Yeah, the thing is, we have really everything at hand. I mean, we are in the VM. We can query for the bytecodes, for the constant tool, for everything. And on the Java side, OK, there's a stack walker, and there are also bytecode APIs. But it's more complicated to, to get all the data we need here. So um, I think it, it was really the, the, the best way. And in the end, I'll come to that. Um, yeah, we'll come in the end to that. Um, maybe by this algorithm or this, this part, this bytecode um, class, um, we can leverage it for other exceptions as well. So, OK, then another point. Um, the best results you will see, obviously, when you uh, compile the Java class um, with, the, with the right debug settings. So default of Java C um, is only the lines and source uh, information. So um, in the call stack, you will get the line numbers and, and, and the source file. But you usually don't have the variables unless you um, compile with this uh, minus g flag or this minus g um, vars line source, whatever you can specify. So once we have the variables, um, then we can, we can print them in the message. If we don't have them, for, for locals, we have to print something like parameter 1, parameter 2 for the, for the method. Or um, for, lo for local um, variables, it's even more complicated because then we only have slot numbers. And so it's not really um, accurate. Or you don't know what the compiler does uh, where um, variables get allocated. Yeah, OK. So um, yeah, things still to be done. So as I said, this feature is now kind of beta. It's, it's uh, disabled. So we are hoping to, to get this enabled by default one day. So um, maybe let's see how, how the, uh, the feedback is. Um, but um, we will try to, to ask uh, the, the OpenJDK community 
if we can switch it on. Um, then there's something uh, objects require non null. Um, so uh, you might heard about that one. So uh, this is some place, um, maybe also a means of, of tackling such uh, null pointer exceptions. You can, before you, you call into another method, you can wrap it with a call to um, objects require non null. Um, then at that place, before uh, we actually enter the method, we check for the null. Um, then you have a defined place in the code where this could happen. Uh, also, you, you would not um, go further down in the program and see the null pointer exception at places where you, where you really don't want it. But on the other hand, um, then you lose this information because this is uh, then um, a null pointer exception that, that the developer has uh, written or has constructed. So yeah, our thing is not uh, applied then. Okay. Um, then um, there's this thing like single file source code mode. So there was uh, JEP 330. You can now uh, you don't need to use a Java file, uh, compile it, and, and, and invoke Java with with a class file. But you can go like in script mode or so, call Java with a .java file. Um, and then um, the you at the moment also don't have this. Um, those null pointer exceptions it would also be nice to have it here. And what you can do is you can um, uh, set the VM option um, yeah, um, by, by parameters to the Java, but you can't um, modify the compiler at the moment. You can't set the minus G option to have the variables. So that's something where we have to find a solution. Then, OK, the JShell use case. I mean, that's really something where you want to go and just prototype something in JShell. And then it would also be nice to, to really get those null pointer exceptions here. So if we do the bullet one and enable it as default, then JShell will have it. Otherwise, um, at least maybe we can make it a default for JShell. <laughs> and then there's another place where the algorithm might be applied. Um, it's the array index uh, out of bounds exception. Um, I think we have some time left, so I can try to, to demo it. Um, I've prepared a little prototype. Oh, actually, it was good. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so you see here it's, it's a little test case where we do um, out of bounds um, accesses on arrays. Um, maybe we can just make it a bit bigger. Okay, so um, maybe we go even back to uh, Java 8 time. So if I run it with uh, JDK 11, so you see here um, it only tells you the index, array index out of bound exception, um, index 5 in line 12. So, mm, yeah, okay, it's only one. One array, um, but if you have a chain of uh, arrays, maybe like um, here, array one, two, minus one. So okay, as we have here the minus one only in one place, we can guess it must must have been this array access. Um, okay, then there's a little enhancement already part of um, I don't know was it ten or eleven, um, which was contributed by by um, by Götz. Um, was it more helpful, right? So we can, we can see the, the index out of bounds for the length. So the array had only the length 4. It already helps a little bit more. And now if we use the, the same algorithm as in the null pointer exception, um, we go and what is this IOB demo even more helpful. Um, so we can really come to some statement about um, what uh, index was it and the array name. Um, yeah. So. That c could leverage the, the feature too. So, yeah. Okay, I think I'm at the end. Um, so, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. Hey. Uh, so, one use case for which I think it's important to have better uh, null pointer messages uh, with respect to the objects required non null is yeah. uh, wherever, basically there are places where Java, the Java C compiler will insert those checks. I know at least two places. One is strings, uh, strings and switch, and the second is when you construct an inner class from, a, from an enclosing class instance. Mm -hmm. In these cases, you can get a null pointer exception, but we won't get any benefit from this work because uh, it's just a, a, an opaque call to require none now. Yeah. So for that, so. actually, I mean, I, I also got also um, did a prototype. <laughs> I brought it here, so maybe we can.
can demonstrate it too. So that's that's this class. Um, so okay, I mean it's really a constructed. Ex uh, uh, I have to. Why doesn't it? I only have this presentation mode. It doesn't jump over. Yeah, I know. That's um, what I'm trying to fix. Maybe we try this, this duplicate. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is the this example here. Okay, it's it's a bit constructed. I mean, you have a chain of require non nullets here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, here it will help um, because with the with the current thing. Um, what is this? Requires no null, the standard thing. So again, I get only a null pointer exception, um, and yeah, I know it's like require no null in, in require no null, and it comes from my line 23 in main, which is this one. Oh, but which require no null was it? Um, and if we yeah we prototype using the null pointer exception algorithm here, um, and so yeah. Um, here we get some message like, uh, okay, there were, it still uh, occurs in require non null, but as we know, this is this met method. We can jump back the stack and then do this computation of the bytecode here and come to come to some explaining uh, message. So that was just an initial approach. So um, I think it's about time that we can discuss it on a mailing list to refine it. Huh? Um, I have a question. Uh, you said um, you need to uh, to compile it with line information with var, with var information. What would the message uh, look like if the var information is not compiled with? Um, there, I think I also have something here <laughs> where I can like local param. Okay, yeah. Okay, so so here we have a we have a function call with a, a method parameter and also we have a local. Um, so now I have to tell Eclipse to change the compilation. Um, Java compiler, take this knob, okay, and then we can run it with um, yeah, what is the NP01? I always have a problem local local param here. Okay, yeah, here you see it. So it would tell you um, parameter one. So um, this is okay, and and then you have here local local two, I think yeah, um, yeah. Um, but local two is is the the slot number because here in the um, I think the slot zero is the this pointer um, to 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 the object. Um, one is used for the parameter index, and then the the um, slot two is local index. So yeah, maybe we should uh, rather say something like uh, local slot or so that. For for um, people analyzing this, it's clear it's not necessarily the, the local variable number two because there's only one, <laughs> but um, it's ma maps rather to the slot number. Yeah. yeah. But still, I mean, there is more information than before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, one question. Uh, you have the information of the vari variable. Uh, is there a way to get the class information? Which class is involved? Um, yeah, I think we, we, we use it. Yeah, um, so in this example, like this. So, um, but the, the class information that's easy. There, you don't need to have the compiled with variable information because the classes with their fields and their names that's part of the constant pool at runtime. So, that's easy. <laughs> I was just wondering. Um, this would be a bit. Um, Susceptible to damage if something bytecode transformed a method and injected code into it. Have you looked at what would happen if that was done? I'm not just thinking of something like Byteman, where I could I could probably break this very quickly, and it would be very rude of me to do so. But I was thinking where you've got uh, code transformers like middleware that does the changes to code. How much would that make this less meaningful? Or do you know? Um, actually, um, I don't know uh, how much Götz has tested those cases. I mean, there are also things like it's, it's not about Java. It's also like other um, languages or so, which compile b down to bytecode. Um, so I would think it's, it's still kind of useful to see um, more information, uh, at least like before. But um, yeah, it's something to be evaluated probably. probably yeah. 
Uh, so you, you answered half of the question I was going to ask by showing the requires null thing. Why wouldn't we want to do that in all cases if, if a null was passed in as an argument, walk back up until we get to a field load somewhere and say it came from this call further up the stack and that's right. where that null actually boiled out and came into this method? Because right now I think normally it's just local, the details are just local to the method, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe in the case where, where um, there's no custom message, which we don't want to override, yeah, maybe we can think about that. Um, yeah. Or maybe you can use an annotation or something where you want to see it, but then you have to annotate methods. So that was um, brought up in the discussion for this objects require non null support, that that would be one way to tackle it. But yeah. Uh, would it be able to tell me that the parameter or the local is an int in this case? Uh, again, the, the local is it? yeah. That the the type of the variable. If I have like a bajillion locals, but each one has like the super long class name. It, I think yes, you have access to the signature of the method, so that should be possible. It gets more complicated um, with the stack slots again, because then you have uh, white slots or, or just one slot. It depends. So then then it's really it's a problem. But for the method signature, it should be there. A quick, quick question on the status. So you mentioned that um, you at a CB machine you have this in uh, version 11. Yeah. I know that Red Hat, being a steward of 11, you doesn't necessarily object to new features like Shenandoah being backported. Now I wonder if this is one of those jobs that could be backported to 11 users. Uh, yeah. Okay, I mean, I mean, have you discussed this, or, or is this was we discussed this? So we didn't bring it up to the table yet. I mean, we were just happy in October that okay, finally it's in. So okay. let's settle it a bit. But okay, yeah, we can start. I don't know if you can backward again, something like that though, <laughs> because this this does change things. Existing application may not spread those exceptions, isn't it? Yeah, maybe if, so if we bring it to eleven, it would be a good idea also to to keep it under the yeah. flag and don't enable it by default. Yeah. Definitely. By default, no. Time's up. So um, I implemented this in Android five years ago, or it became public five years ago, uh, but not to the extent that you've done it here. And the biggest pain in getting this enabled was people who had unit tests where they would capture the exception and put it into a file. Uh, and then all of these golden file tests all broke. Yes. Um, and you keep mentioning changing the message uh, and things like that, and I just keep imagining all of these units as breaking and breaking again. Yeah, that's um, maybe. I mean, even for, for the SAP machine, when we, when we enabled it, we had to go and, I mean, we were running JT rec tests regularly and some things, so we had to change a few places. But well, the golden file had a simple null pointer exception. Yeah. Okay, so I think time's up. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you.